preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Things that are coming up here at the Y and then introduce Professor Pollock. I'm Rabbi David Wozniak. I direct the Y's Bronfman Center for Jewish Life. That's the bulk of the Jewish education programs that are going on here. And I was just discussing with, uh, with someone else, there are actually 800 evenings of Jewish education. So while we're in here tonight, there's another half a dozen classes going on here at the Y. And just to whet your appetite, in case you have, uh, haven't made plans for the rest of the week, on Wednesday evening, I'll be introducing Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, who will be here to speak on the state of anti-Semitism. I think we have no tickets left. If there are, there may be but a few. We've sold like 900 seats uh, for that evening. Um, Thursday night, Professor Ellie Wiesel will be here. Um, there are some, a few seats available for that. Um, also, we're having a program on Hasidut, on Hasidism, on Wednesday night as well. Yossi Balin will be here at the end of the month. Uh, he was ostensibly here to speak about Judaism and, and the diaspora and the whole question of intermarriage and the like, but it is inconceivable to me, given his stature with the Knesset, that the, the issue of what's happening in Israel right now uh, won't come up, and uh, that's November 29th, Wednesday evening. I hope you'll uh, consider being here for that program as well. In December, I will be moderating a panel with a reformed conservative and orthodox rabbi discussing the issue of prayer. Um, and then also starting in January, the first of a three evening series, which I will moderate um, with uh, Max Frankel, who is the executive editor of the New York Times will be here. I'll be looking into his values. Um, Ruth Westheimer, another evening, and Barry Sheck. Um, also a program on the future of American Jewry as part of our Kala program with Dennis Prager, um, Alan Dershowitz, and Ann Royfe. Um, another evening where I will be in conversation with Ellie Wiesel, and then a third evening where we'll have rep people representing four of the great Jewish thinkers uh, in our history, um, Rabbi Akiva, uh, Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Soloveitchik, and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. That's just a taste of uh, a lot more to offer, all of which is in your brochure. You are cordially invited to be here, and I hope that you will join us for as many of those evenings as possible. Let me now introduce to you uh, Professor Robert Pollack, which I could tell when he walked in, he has a lot of friends, and so you could probably, many of you, give a nice introduction, uh, much more likely than I could, but let me share with you just um, something uh, a little more formal. Since 1994, he has consecrated his efforts on the many questions that lie at the margin of science and religion. He is the director of the Center for the Study and Science of Study of Science and Religion at Columbia University, where he established this program in the hopes of overcoming the unjustifiable interest science and religion have had for one another's, or disinterest it should be, for one another's accomplishment. He grew up in Brooklyn and graduated Columbia University with a major in physics, and he received his PhD in biology from Brandeis University. He has been Professor of Biological Sciences of Columbia since 1978 and was Dean of Columbia College from 1982 to 1989. Since 1998, Professor Pollock has served as the President of the Hillel of Columbia University and Barnard College. He received the Lionel Trilling Award for his book, Signs of Life, the Language and Meanings of DNA. And since then, the book has been translated into six languages. He is also editor-in-chief of a two-volume encyclopedia of science and religion to be published in the year 2002. His latest book, which was just published, is entitled The Biology of Faith, sorry, The Faith of Biology and the Biology of Faith, which received a wonderful, wonderful review, by the way, in last week's Jewish Week from Sandy Borowski. And he, the book is available, by the way, for those of you who would like to purchase it after the lecture. And Professor Pollock, I know, will be happy to sign those books as well. Tonight, he speaks on Judaism and science, a personal perspective, and he will discuss how he, as a committed Jew, grapples with the questions raised by some of the recent biomedical and scientific advances. I met Bob about a year and a half ago, I guess, in a restaurant. I remember, I don't know if you remember this. He, I said to him, how will I know who you are? How will I recognize you? And he said, I look a little like Robert Bork. <clears throat> and he said, how will I recognize you? And I said, I look like a little chubby Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and, 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 we, and I, shh, please. And I walked into the restaurant and it was instant. We recognized each other instantly for another reason. We were the only two people in the restaurant. <laughs> but, uh, 
But more importantly, I remember having this wonderful, thoughtful conversation, being absolutely mesmerized by this man who was, I think, in the best sense, struggling, if, if that's the right way to put it, with his Judaism and his science. And since that time, about a year and a half ago, I have been very much looking forward to the genesis of this talk. So it was with great joy that I introduced to you Professor Robert Pollack. So, hi. Um, I see before me all the synagogues I know, <laughs> and then some other people as well. Um, David's very kind to list all those things I've done, but they're not what I'm doing, really. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to live a Jewish life and be a scientist. And uh, while there are many Jewish scientists, most of them and most people who know them know that they, by and large, consider that a choice one makes. That is, one is either serious about one's religion or one is serious about one's science. And I want to explain how it is that I think it's possible, in fact, I think it's necessary that one be serious about both or else one is really not serious about either. And toward that end, I wrote this book, The Faith of Biology and the Biology of Faith. And what I'd like to do, since it's about the question David asked me to speak on, it's about how one lives in the gap between a science and a religion, not how one reconciles the two, but why it is necessary to accept the gap and live with both parts of it. Why, in other words, a bridge is necessary rather than just a fusion. Uh, I'm going to try and explain a bit about my book, and then I'd like to take a few short passages, which, which is passages which I think are relevant to the purpose of this meeting, this talk, and not occupy your time much more than tops a half an hour with a reading, and then really open this up to discussion. I'd like to hear from all of you what you think of what I'm saying. It's helpful to me as I plan my next book, and it will indicate to me that this book was not a waste of time if I strike a spark in any of you. So um, this will be a three-part session. The first part is what I'm doing now, which is explaining what I want to do. And the second part is uh, telling you something about my book. And the third part is reading from it. And then we have the real body of it, which is, I hope, an interesting conversation. So I called it the faith of biology and the biology of faith. And I think the first question is, what is that title supposed to mean? What is the faith of biology? Well, to me, the faith of biology is the same as the faith of, of all sciences. That is, that there's nothing unknowable. That while not everything is known, given enough time and money, everything will be known. Why is this a matter of faith? It's a matter of faith because we don't know, we cannot know, whether or not there's anything unknowable. Observing the faith of science means surrendering all alternative religious beliefs. It means, I've got to switch glasses, sorry, I'm at that age where no pair of glasses is exactly right. So, The faith of science means not observing any other alternative faiths. It's like any other religion. Its exclusivity gives science, in fact, the aspect of a religion. Do scientists need to share in this faith that there is nothing unknowable in order to carry out their experiments, to test their ideas, or to build their models of what is knowable? I think on the contrary, and this is where I guess I become who I am now, it seems to me that faith in the existence of the unknowable is as reasonable a choice as faith in the non-existence of the unknowable, since we can't know. So this book in my life, I have to say more than just the book, follow out the implications of this rather, to me, surprising notion that a scientist may choose, and I would say may need to choose, another faith rather than faith in science in order to do her or his best work. So then what's the biology of faith? I, I put three notions to, the, to, the, to the, the title, the biology of faith. The first is that there is an obligation every religious tradition has to accept the facts of the natural world as they are revealed by science. 
It seems to me that's an obligation of every grown-up person of whatever religion. In the case of biology, this includes the bodily nature of all there is to us that we can know and the certainty that bodies must irrevocably die. Second, the biology of faith refers to the idea that the individual experience of faith, the sorts of religious experiences William James refers to, share with all other experiences an eerie place in biology. Like all experiences, religious experiences occur inside our bodies. In that sense, faith is grounded in the biology of the body and the brain. Third, and this returns to the specificity of my own life, the facts of religious history, the shared history of those who share a faith, may demonstrably affect their genes, their DNA, their biological inheritance. So in the end, this book is about my discovery that I choose not to make what I consider to be a false choice, even though almost all of my colleagues have done so. What do I mean by a false choice? A false choice is a social convenience, an intellectual construct that forces a person to abandon one legitimate desire in order to satisfy another equally legitimate wish. Faith and reason are a false choice. Religion and science are a false choice. Order and meaning are a false choice. All of these exist as false choices to me. All of these are seen as necessary choices to most religious people and to most scientists. So if I, if I have accomplished anything and if I can do anything tonight, it would be to press the case and hear why you might think I'm wrong. That we have an obligation to push away false choices like these and give ourselves the benefit of both order and meaning, both religion and science, both faith and reason, all at the same time. In fact, I would argue, and I hope I have time to argue, that it's necessary to do this. Otherwise, we will never really understand the priorities of medical research in the light of the insights of any religious tradition, in particular Judaism. And I think it's necessary to reconcile religious traditions with the descriptions of nature revealed by science, or else we will not have good medicine. So that's the introduction to my book, From Me. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to read a piece of my book, actually a couple of pieces, which I chose specifically to address the questions of personal choice, as David asked me. First reading is My Religion and Its Place in This Book. I'm not a representative of religion as such, nor of science and such, uh, as such. I'm a particular person with a history of experience in one religion and one science, a Jewish molecular biologist. The example, for instance, of evolution is interesting to me as a Jewish molecular biologist, not because of its capacity to generate controversy, nor because most religions, including Judaism, continue to have great difficulty in absorbing the detailed facts and implications of the record of natural selection. I picked this topic for my work because evolution through natural selection explains certain facts of life that touch on matters of meaning and purpose, and because the vision of, natural, of the natural world these explanations of science produce is simply too terrifying and depressing to me to be born without the emotional buffer of my own religion. This buffer is simple to describe. A Jewish understanding of our appearance by evolution through natural selection introduces a fundamentally irrational certainty of meaning and purpose to a set of data that otherwise show no sign of supporting any meaning to our lives on Earth beyond that of being numbers in a cosmic lottery with no paymaster. I've chosen to write from this perspective as I've chosen to take my religion seriously in response to unbidden, spontaneous, strong, inward feelings, feelings I'm no longer able to avoid acknowledging. There is a price to be paid for approaching the data of science from such a perspective. I must write from the heart 
and place feelings on a par with facts, something a scientist is ordinarily obliged to avoid doing. And in so doing, I am at risk of alienating an audience most important to me. The reasonable people, some of them my closest colleagues, some of them I'm sure in this room now, who share my conclusions but not my belief in the existence of a caring God. To forestall that, let me agree with them here before saying anything more, that matters of personal belief cannot finally be tested by science and that therefore I neither may nor shall pass judgment on anyone else. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.